This is the Natural History Museum. Welcome to NHM Live. In a couple of minutes, you'll be meeting one of our scientists. This is your chance to ask some questions directly. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's find out who our scientist is today. My name's Jeff Stryker, and I'm a curator of herpetology at the Natural History Museum. That means I help take care of our large collection of amphibian and reptile specimens. Herpetology is the study of many familiar animals, including frogs, toads, salamanders, lizards, snakes, and turtles. With almost 200,000 specimens from around the globe, the herpetology collection at the Natural History Museum is ideally suited for scientific research. That means my job includes lots of interactions with researchers and students, as well as pursuing my own research. My research focuses mostly on frogs and snakes and involves collecting different types of information from specimens. For example, we sequence lots of DNA in order to understand how populations and species change through time. As a museum curator, my job also involves public engagement and science communication. I think this is one of my favorite things about working at the Natural History Museum, that I regularly get the opportunity to share how museum collections produce new discoveries in amphibian and reptile biology, provide insights into human health and evolution, and more generally, provide us with a clearer understanding of the forces that shape the natural world. Hello everyone, welcome to NHM Live. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today's show where we're talking snakes with Dr. Jeff Stryker. Now as ever we are live so if you do have any questions for Jeff please do send those through, we'll get through as many of those as we can. Now Jeff thank you so much for coming down to talk to us today. Now we saw, yeah. we saw in your bio you're responsible in part for looking after our collection of snakes. Right. How comprehensive is the museum's collection? So uh, in terms of herpetology in general, we have about 200,000 specimens and it's quite comprehensive. We have representatives from all families of amphibian and reptile and also from most geographic regions. Uh, and we're, we, we pr in particular we have strengths in snakes where again we have representatives from most families and most places around the globe. It is. It's an amazing collection. And you've brought some examples down to show yes. us today, yeah. which we will look at in a bit more detail. But before we do, if we perhaps kind of um, go back to basics. So where on the uh, uh, evolutionary tree do snakes actually fit? Right, yeah. So probably uh, it's, it's a good idea to start with what a snake actually is, right? And I'm very happy to be here talking about snakes. I've brought some specimens with me to try and help illustrate what snakes are. Uh, so I think a lot of people think of snakes as limbless reptiles, which they are, <laughs> but it's important to uh, discuss what types of reptiles they are, what reptile group they belong to. So snakes are part of a group of reptiles called squamates, and this includes animals that we commonly think of as lizards and snakes. Uh, and it's kind of an, they're an interesting group evolutionarily because uh, a lot of research, including some that we've done here at the Natural History Museum, really suggests suggests that uh, some lizard groups are much more closely related to snakes than they are to other lizard groups. So in a way, you can kind of think of snakes as limbless lizards, but it's uh, not really being limbless that makes a snake a snake. Absolutely. So if it's not limblessness, then, then what is it? What makes a snake a snake? Right, sure. So, I've, so I have some specimens that help illustrate this point. So um, although snakes do lack arms and legs, they're not unique among squamates in that way. And I've actually brought representatives from other uh, squamate groups, including uh, a group of lizards known as skinks, a group of lizards known as geckos, uh, an interesting group of squamates called amphispanids, and also a, a species that might be familiar to some of our viewers here in the UK called the slow worm, which are all examples of more or less legless squamates that have either lost most of their limbs or lost all of their limbs, but none of them are snakes. So what makes a snake a snake? It's actually a combination of characteristics, uh, adaptations, uh, one of which we're going to be talking about today, that uh, we really use to uh, help us figure out what we what we call a snake. And those two key adaptations that we really think about are a forked tongue. So snakes, uh, you know, they kind of, um, uh, they have chemosensory abilities that are a bit different from other squamates. Uh, that forked tongue and then in combination with uh, lacking external ears, uh, which we do see in some lizard groups, but uh, the combination of those two and a very unique uh, set of feeding strategies makes snakes snakes. Right, and we'll be talking about those feeding strategies in a moment. <laughs> yeah. Now snakes, they're incredibly successful creatures, aren't they? Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So snakes, um, they're kind of unique among squamates in that they've actually managed to colonize almost every corner 
corner of the planet. So there are snakes that live in the sea. Uh, there are snakes that spend their whole lives underwater in freshwater and swamps and lakes and things like that. Uh, there are snakes that spend their whole lives underground. They're burrowing. They've even almost lost their eyes completely. Uh, there are also snakes that live in trees, uh, snakes that uh, have a variety of uh, kind of very niche specializations for where they live, in addition to those that we see kind of uh, scurrying around our gardens. And how many um, species are there in the world? Do we know? Right, great question. So there are more or less about 3,000 species of snakes, which is kind of impressive considering among squamates, there are, only, there are about 10,000 species. So about a third of all squamate diversity is actually snakes. Wow, it yeah. is impressive. It is impressive. Now, we are going to talk a little bit about those feeding strategies because they, sure. are, they are unique to, uh, to snakes. Yeah. Um, and they are often a source of fear in people and uh, quite right. a lot of misunderstanding. Mm. So the most obvious feeding strategies that we would think of are envenomation and constriction. So if we start with venom, right. how many types of snakes are actually venomous? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And I think a lot of the, the, the fear people have is often... Uh, uh, maybe slightly based on some misinformation because mm. I think, for example, venom, which is one reason that I think some people fear snakes, we have to keep in mind that venom actually is in relatively few snakes. Um, and it's also something that all available evidence suggests evolved primarily as a way for snakes to acquire prey, for a safe way for them to get a, to uh, actually be able to eat and, and make a living. Um, but in terms of how many venomous snakes there are, it's actually, in terms of those venomous snakes that are dangerous to mammals like ourselves, it's only three major groups of snakes that we really uh, see uh, what most people think of as venom in, uh, where we have uh, specialized glands and specialized teeth that inject the toxins that those glands make. Uh, and I've brought some representatives of uh, the three venomous snake groups. And so that includes, uh, here I've got the, this cobra um, that I've brought with me. This is a, a representative of the family Elapidae. So it also contains other types of snakes like sea snakes and these brightly colored coral snakes, which oh. are often red, yes. yellow, and black, yeah. you may have heard of those. Uh, but so these, uh, these snakes have these fixed front fangs. Uh, they're venomous. Um, there's also a, a group of snakes that uh, many of our viewers are gonna be familiar with called the vipers that includes our native uh, adder that we have here in the UK and also iconic species such as the rattlesnake that I've brought with me. Um, and their fangs are slightly different in the way they work. They're called selenoglyphus, but um, they're also venomous. And then the third group of snakes is, is a big family or a big group rather called that we re commonly refer to in herpetology as colubrids, uh, where we often see rear fangs, but there are it's, there, it's a lot more variable in that family in terms of which species are dangerous to mammals or, or specialize in mammalian prey, rather, and those that don't. So really, those, those are the, the places that we see what I think most people think of as venomous snakes. And are there different types of venom with different effects? Sure, absolutely. So snake venom itself that we see in, in some of the specimens I brought here is actually this really complex cocktail of a variety of, uh, of biological macromolecules, primarily proteins, these uh, proteolytic enzymes. And the two major kind of classes of toxin that we often think of with venomous snakes uh, are one called neurotoxins. So these are toxins that uh, kind of target the nervous system and they kind of immobilize prey for the snake. Um, and then there's another group of toxins that we call cytotoxins that the one most people I think probably would have heard of are hemotoxins. So these are more associated with doing cell damage and they, they mess with the circulatory system and things like that. But uh, th those are really, I think, the major categories of venom that we, that we see in snakes. Um, is the venom involved in digesting the prey at all, or is it just sure. incapacitating it? Yeah, no, it, so it is, I mean, the primary uh, goal, uh, I think most biologists would agree, is to secure the prey, mm. uh, but it does actually start some pre-digestive processes. So I think you can keep in mm. mind that um, venom glands, uh, actually I've got a, a model here that I can show you that kind of illustrates a... Uh, where venom glands sit uh, in, in the snake's face. I mean, these are modified uh, parotid glands or salivary glands. And so actually a lot of the, the, the proteins that we see in venoms, actually we see some very similar proteins in saliva of other reptiles. Ah, so is that how we, we think that venom evolved then from, from modified saliva? Absolutely, yeah, that, that, that's the prevailing hypothesis. Wow, absolutely yeah. fascinating.
And now we've got a question online from Alistair on okay. Facebook. Um, have you ever had a dangerous or scary encounter with a snake? That's an excellent <laughs> question. So yeah, there, I'm, uh, as a herpetologist that does field work, uh, mm. we, we, we do our best to be careful and do risk assessments before going into the field. Um, whenever we encounter venomous snakes or a snake that we don't really recognize right away, uh, we're always very careful to use uh, protective equipment, whether that's the form of tongs or uh, protective leg coverings and things like that. Um, but in terms of whether or not I've actually, I, I've had a couple of scary moments, mostly when uh, a venomous snake was suddenly in our presence and we weren't prepared for it. Uh, but luckily we had our tongs with us, so uh, <laughs> uh, things turned out all right. But uh, so far, so uh, far, nothing too terribly scary. <laughs> that's good, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, venom we, we've covered already, but you've brought some other types of snakes along with you. Right. Now, constriction, that's a, sure. another very well-known uh, method of, 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 of um, killing prey. And we've yeah. got some constrictors here. Is that a common uh, method with snakes? Yeah, it's actually, it's much more common than venom. If, if you look across the snake tree of life in terms of which families, which species are constrictors. Uh, and I've brought two, I think, great representatives of snakes that use constriction to grab prey, but they, uh, two species that do it in very different habitats. Uh, so this snake that I have with me here is going to be recognizable to many people. It's a large python, kind of our classic uh, idea of what a constrictor is. The snake with yeah. these very large teeth that grabs its food, wraps its large coils around the prey item, and then slowly more or less suffocates it, right? Um, so this is one example of a constrictor. There are many smaller terrestrial or land-dwelling snakes that also more or less use the same feeding mechanism to secure their prey. Uh, I've also brought with me uh, a constrictor that some people might not have heard of before. And this is a specimen that is, belongs to a species called the file snake in the genus Acrocordus. And this is a, a snake that is almost completely aquatic. They don't, wa they don't, they don't do a very good job on land. Uh, and in its aquatic, aquatic environment, it specializes on eating fish. So it actually it uses constriction uh, in, in addition to these modified scales that it has that are very rough and very rigid to hold on to really slimy fish uh, so it can get a chance to, uh, to get them in its mouth. That's fantastic. You don't tend to think of the constriction actually happening underwater. underwater. Right, yeah. That's crazy. The life aquatic. You yeah. Know, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, we've, got, uh, ooh, we've got some questions coming in. We've got a question from uh, Periscope. I think it's Jimenez asks, which came first, snakes or lizards? Uh, which came first, snakes <laughs> or lizards? So, uh, as I mentioned at the, the top of the, the show, um, so snakes are more closely related to some lizard groups than some lizard groups are, more, are, are related to other lizards. So, it really depends on what type of lizard you're talking about. <laughs> In terms of the general morphology that we, you know, we think of lizards as uh, squamates with legs and, and long tails, uh, the, the, the ancestral squamate reptile almost certainly looked more lizard-like than snake-like. Um, although there are some very, very old snake fossils and uh, even um, uh, some, uh, some classic fossils like mosasaurs that you can see here in our museum, mm -hmm. uh, those are thought to be, uh, have evolved within the lineage that led to snakes as well. So oh. uh, there's been a lot of really dynamic things going on in squamate evolution. Yeah. Fantastic. And on a related note, James Smart on Facebook, yeah. are there any recently extinct species of snake which would surprise us today? Recently extinct. Um, so, I mean, we do, believe it or not, there, is, there are actually uh, research programs in snake conservation, uh, and they, they, a lot of them center around those snake species that either are habitat specialists um, or those that are uh, per perhaps persecuted because of the way they acquire prey, and, and which makes mm -hmm. them slightly dangerous to people. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't really think of a good example of where we've got really compelling evidence that there's been, uh, you know, an, a, an extirpation or an extinction uh, of, a, of a snake that would surprise people, because most of them would be in, in places that are heavily urbanized, you know, like a big city where, you know, if we went back to 1850, we would be able to go collect a snake, you know, but now it's the middle of Manhattan Avenue or something, right? Of course, yeah. of course. Um, now, um, We've uh, taken a look at venom and constriction. Right, yeah. Now, obviously, regardless of how a snake gets hold of its prey, all of them swallow their prey whole, don't they? They do indeed, yeah. Now, um, earlier this week, Jeff and I went behind the scenes to, uh, in our museum store to take a closer look at the fascinating anatomy that allows them to do that. So let's see how we got on. Yeah. 
We're behind the scenes in the museum's dry store where we store and keep some of our taxidermy and skeletal specimens. Now, Jeff, you brought out some fantastic specimens here of snake skeletons. What are we looking at? What species is this? Yeah, so what we have in front of us here is a species called a Burmese python. Uh, and it's a, it's a good example of a, a large constrictor. So these specimens really allow us to look in detail at the anatomy of snakes. Now they're renowned for swallowing their prey whole, quite large prey as well. How do they manage to do that? So they actually, they have several adaptations that help them do that. Probably the key adaptation that allows them to take such large food items is that their, their lower jaws here, bones that we call their mandibles, unlike in animals like ourselves where these bones are fused in something called a mandibular symphysis, snakes actually either have a very reduced symphysis or no symphysis at all, and this allows the lower jaws lots of range of movement, and so they can really open them very wide to fit around large prey items. Um, and they also have some other really interesting adaptations related to their teeth. I've actually got a, uh, a skull from the same species, but disarticulated, so not put together all nicely like this, uh, to show you. So this is the top of the skull. And then uh, on the bottom here, we can actually see that snakes have two rows of teeth in the tops of their mouths. And so one of these on the outside, the maxillary teeth, this is related to actually gripping food so it doesn't get away, which is quite helpful, you can imagine, when you don't have any arms to hold it for you. Um, but these uh, teeth that are in the middle, uh, these teeth that are called the palatine or pterygoid teeth, they're actually used to help the snake kind of walk the food down into its stomach, or for at least a lot of um, the larger snakes like python uh, will, will um, actually swallow their food that way. And so that's really one of the, the, the flexibility that they get from the lower jaws, and then the help they get from these specialized teeth are really how they manage to handle such big food items. Uh, so this idea that snakes dislocate their, their jaws when they're eating, that's, that's not quite accurate. No, that's, unfortunately <laughs> it's not. And actually, I've got a, another um, skeletal prep over here that, that kind of illustrates this nicely. Is that So this is a, this is a type of snake, an, an elapid, a relative of a cobra and a sea snake. Uh, and you can actually see across the lower jaws here, they've left some of the, the connections, some of the skin and some of the tissues uh, that are normally there in life and quite flexible. And so actually, the disarticulation bit, the, the, these part, the joints that connect the mandible to the back of the skull are always uh, in place, or else the snake's in a bit of trouble. I was surprised to see quite so many teeth in the, in the skull of this snake. Are, are these distinct from, from fangs that inject venom? Sure, so well, fangs are specialized teeth that inject venom, but uh, the, the teeth that we're seeing here in the python, for example, are not fangs. Uh, they're, they're more used to secure the, the prey. However, in the elapid, we actually can see um, that the, two of the small teeth in the front, um, they are actually fangs, so there are those fixed fangs. I guess what I'm getting at is uh, snakes have lots and lots of teeth, and larger snakes like this that specialize in mammalian prey often have quite sharp teeth that are specialized for holding on to, you know, large, warm-blooded prey. Yeah, they would definitely grip, yeah. wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. um, now, the, the rest of the skeleton, the ribs, is that similarly flexible to allow them to... Sure, absolutely. I mean, and you can see, I mean, snakes are pretty much all ribs. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating uh, body plan for a vertebrate. Um, but yeah, so the, the way that the, um, the, the, the actual tissues sit over the ribs, uh, there's quite a bit of flexibility there as well. So if this small python were, say, to eat a, I don't know, a rabbit or something like that, uh, the ribs would give way as it, as it begins to digest. Um, now, another, another key thing to keep in mind is that they have quite efficient digestive systems. So uh, this snake, if it were to eat that rabbit, would digest the whole animal, including its bones. Uh, so by the time it gets further down the digestive tract, a lot of, you know, often it's, there's not much of it left. Welcome back. We're live talking snakes with Dr. Jeff Stryker. We've had some fantastic questions through already. Keep them coming. We'll get through as many of those as we can. Absolutely. So I've got a, a couple of questions here. Fantastic. Um, now, Christine on Facebook is asking, are the leg genes still present in the snake genome? That's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a lot of scientists are actually working on this question. So snakes are... Uh, of a lot of interest, kind of like we saw in that, that previous clip, they're, they're quite elongate, right? And that's mm. very different from what we see in most other reptiles and other vertebrates. Uh, and so uh, a lot of scientists looking at the genomes of snakes have found out a lot of crazy things about their genomes. Uh, they've looked a little bit at the legless thing. Almost certainly some of the developmental genes that, that have to do with limb development are in there. And we, we knew that before we were able to look at genomes too, because some uh, groups of snakes like the python that we have here, uh, they actually retain some, uh, they retain their, their pelvic girdle, so the, their hips. 
Um, and so you actually, if you look in a snake skeleton, some python and boa skeletons, you see this little bony element. Um, and so we, we know that there's still developmentally some things are going on. Uh, the interesting question that a lot of biologists, or genomicists rather, are asking now uh, is, okay, when, you, when you've evolved, you know, in theory for so long without needing these leg genes per se, what happens to those genes? And so the current research is really investigating once you can identify what the set of genes are, which uh, is not as straightforward as it sounds. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, there are many different genes that uh, could be interacting with one another to cause something to happen in development. Once you identify those, the interesting question is in snakes that don't really need those, uh, has, have they lost their, their, their functional significance and started disappearing into the genome through something we call being, becoming pseudogenes? And so um, I know that's not an answer, a direct <laughs> answer to that question, but stay tuned. I think there's a lot of exciting research related to that question coming out soon. Excellent. Excellent. And something I found out the other day, snakes technically have tails. That's which right. You don't yeah, think yeah. About. That's right. And some snakes have short tails, others yeah. have long tails. And they're actually really strong ecological correlates with the size of a snake's tail. For example, arboreal snakes tend to have really long tails, and those that are burrowing or fossorial have very stumpy little tails often. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Now, Eugene on Facebook is asking, do snakes have taxon-specific food preferences? Ah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, in, in the business, we'd say, do, do snakes, uh, is there a phylogenetic signal in food preference, right? Um, so, um, it depends on where you're looking at, I think. And I'm, uh, I, I bet there's a scientific paper out there that addresses <laughs> exactly this question. Um, but I mean, we know just from, you know, like some of the constriction and venom acquisition that we've talked about, uh, there's almost certainly that signal there, but I think it varies a lot, right? And we, and you know, I mentioned the group colubrids earlier, that some are venomous, some, some aren't. There's a variety of feeding strategies that have evolved, including some we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Uh, and so in, in those groups, um, the signal might not be as clear because there's may have been more ecological opportunities than have been presented to other groups. Now we've got a, a very interesting question from Ed on yeah. Periscope. He asks, um, can you eat snakes and have you ever eaten a snake? That's a great question, Ed. Uh, you, can <laughs> eat, you can eat out anything. No. Um, so yes, uh, many, pe many people eat snakes. So there are many, plenty of places in the world where snakes are eaten. Um, uh, have I eaten a snake? Was that what part of the question yeah. as well? Okay. Um, I have actually eaten a snake <laughs> before. Uh, we, well, we were doing um, field work in Indonesia uh, on the island of Java, and we had, there's, there are restaurants that serve cobra. Uh, and I, I, so I've eaten cobra before. Tasty? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, they, it was deep fried, so it was delicious. Uh, but um, it, yeah, it had kind of like a strong, uh, it was like a strong poultry kind of is what it tasted like. That's my best recollection. <laughs> Everything tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, we have brought along a couple more unusual specimens for us to have a look at, because sure. obviously um, venom and constriction, they're not the only ways that snakes actually make a living. There Absolutely. are some, some different feeding strategies. Yeah. Um, if we start uh, with the snakes at the far end, the, the blind snakes. Yeah, sure. So yeah, blind snakes are a really interesting group of snakes to talk about, not only in terms of snake evolution, but particularly snake feeding. So most blind snakes look very much like these specimens that I have here. Depending where you are in the world, sometimes they're called worm snakes or flower pot snakes. Uh, but uh, a pretty common characteristic of, of these types of snakes is that most of them are heavy burrowers. They rarely come above the surface. And you can hopefully see from some of these specimens in the pictures that we're seeing that they actually don't have very distinctive heads mm. relative to other snakes, which is where the you know, common name worm snake kind of comes from. Uh, and because of that, or per perhaps because of that, um, they're, a, they're a little bit more constrained in what they can eat, uh, both being burrowers and having small heads. And so most, uh, most blind snakes actually specialize in, in insects that also live underground or in worms that live under, or things like worms that live underground. Uh, and how you deal with, uh, with really like a, a swarming ant colony in terms of how you maximize your feeding mechanism is quite different from constriction or venom. And so it was uh, quite fascinating when scientists started looking at this to find out that there's a lot of variation in the, the way that the skulls of blind snakes look. So we had a nice introduction to that in our pre-recorded segment. And so unlike that python where we saw so many teeth, you know, we saw them in different elements of the skull, the maxilla, mm. the premaxilla, the pterygoids, and on the mandibles as well, uh, blind snakes, uh, in a different sense, they, they've lost a lot of those, or in, in this, they've lost a lot of those 
teeth. And in some blind snakes, they only have teeth on the mandible, on the bottom jaw, right? And unlike, uh, unlike all the snakes that we've been talking about so far, which really, you know, that, that flexible, se you know, the, the separation of the mandibles gives them a lot of uh, flexibility with what they can eat. These blind snakes eat more or less like we do. So bilaterally, is, or they, they actually kind of shovel in these soft-bodied insects into their mouth, kind of like a hoover a bit. So they're actually, they have this, uh, these mandibles that very effectively do this motion into their mouth. So something we call mandibular raking. So scooping them in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're also very, very small. Is that about as small as snakes get? It is actually. So the, the, the world's smallest snake, if I'm not mistaken, is a blind snake from the West Indies, actually. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've got a picture, a picture yeah. there. Absolutely tiny. Yeah. Um, now, David on Facebook has asked, what's the smallest, but also what's the biggest snake alive ah, today? Ah, the biggest snake. So, uh, <laughs> that's an excellent question. And the it, it's not a, a straightforward answer, only because it, de it depends on what we define as big. Uh, so, if we define big in terms of weight or mass, or we define big in terms of length, uh, we've got different answers. Uh, I actually have what the, the record holder for longest snake in the world here, the reticulated python. And we saw in the pre-recorded clip the one of the may sometimes title holders of the heaviest snake in the world, the Burmese python. But the anaconda, another snake many people have probably heard of, okay. is also a snake that gets you know, massive and can get very heavy. So uh, th those would be the, if, if we had to give our best answer, those are the top three contenders for being the world's largest snake. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Now there is uh, one more set of specimens we just want to take a look at, because sure. these are fascinating. Uh, what are these two down here? Yeah, I love talking about these snakes. Very excited to have them here today. So I've got two examples of snakes that have a very different feeding strategy than most people would associate with snakes and that they uh, they don't sp they, they actually they're dietary specialists they only eat one type of food and it's actually slugs and snails uh, so they actually specialize on eating mollusks uh, and I, I brought two different species with me to demonstrate this I've got one uh, Aploptera boa here that's from uh, the old from Asia uh, and I've got another Dipsis catesbii which is from uh, South America to demonstrate that on opposite sides of the world you have these uh, these snail and slugs slug eating specialists that have evolved and hopefully you can see that their, uh, their head morphology is actually quite similar, uh, almost certainly because uh, there's a particular set of skull characteristics that are really good at getting snails out of their shell. Uh, so yeah, so in addition to eating large mammals and fish and just about everything you can imagine, uh, snakes also uh, will eat slugs and snails. All kinds of ways of making a living. That's They're right. Fascinating yeah, yeah. creatures. Snakes do a great job of that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got a couple of questions um, online. We've got Chris on Periscope asking, um, can we explain why snake locomotion freaks people out? And Sylvia also on right. Facebook, why have humans been scared of snakes throughout history? Right. Two, no, two that, related questions. Yeah. No. So yeah, that's those are both great questions, and uh, there, there's actually uh, a lot of really interesting research going on, and it's kind of cool because it crosses the boundaries of kind of biology into human sociology and our cultural history and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but there's uh, emerging evidence that primates and snakes, you know, primates are so the lineage that we've evolved from, uh, and snakes and belong to, uh, that, that they have this very complicated evolutionary history. And there are all of these potential uh, correlates with snake behavior and human behavior and the way that other primates interact with snakes that maybe uh, suggest that snakes and primates have been having a very uh, ongoing and very old kind kind of interaction with one another where one is afraid of the other one and, and mm. would actually seek out and get rid of the, the other would get rid of the other one to keep themselves safe. Uh, so yeah, there's some, there's some uh, I think a few papers that have been recently published that kind of uh, do a very good job of illustrating the evidence for this going back in time. Yeah. Now, of course, there are some snakes we do need to be wary of, but generally sure. they're, they're more beneficial than they are harmful. Is, is that correct? Sure, absolutely. I mean, they, they provide a massive ecological service, you know, particularly, I mean, snakes that live close to where pe people do, um, most of what they're eating are disease agents for people, so things like rats and mice. Um, they also play their really important roles as predators in most mm. ecosystems, whether they're aquatic or terrestrial. Um, and yeah, so they, 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 have a, they, they play a really important part, and, and most of them we have no reason to be concerned of. But I would say in general, the rule that we follow as well when we go in the field is if you don't know very much about a snake or you don't recognize it when you see it, you can leave it alone. And yep. it will almost certainly just go about its way and, and not bother you either. That's good advice. Yeah. That's very good <laughs> advice. Now, Jeff, unfortunately, we are we are out of time. But thank okay. you so much for coming down to talk to my us pleasure. today. Thank you for having Showing me. these great specimens. Yeah. And thank you to all of our viewers online for your excellent questions. Now, don't worry if we didn't get to your question. Jeff will pop online for the next 10 minutes okay. or so to answer any that we didn't manage to get to.
Thank you very much, guys. This is our final show for this series, but we will be back with a new series a little later on in the year. But for now, thank you and goodbye.